Thank you for the introduction, Mr. Chairman. Very kind of you to say the lovely things about me. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about colorectal surgery. Do I need this? Yeah, is that better? Yes. Or is that on? Good. Hello. Yes, okay. Okay. Right. I'm not here to talk to you about colorectal surgery today, though some of it will be. Um, will invariably be included in this uh, in any talk I give. But the question that I was asked to address was how can we continue to be, how do we evolve with the evolutions in medical education if you want to continue to be trainers in, within medical education. So that is the concept that I am addressing rather than. Um, pleasure to be here. I've met many of you over the last many years um, with conferences like this where I've been invited. It's always been a privilege and uh, thank you again for inviting me. So I've got my affiliations there at university and uh, uh, my primary hospital is Prince Charles Hospital, which is where I do the bulk of my uh, clinical work. So the objectives of today's talk really is to discuss some of the changes within the world of medical education, discuss strategies for coping and in fact, excelling as a trainer under these changing with these challenges. I'm going to I'll try and share some of my successes and my failures with as a trainer with, with you. Um, some of the useful tools that I've picked up over the years, and perhaps reflect on my own learning through this whole process. To start the talk about how to be a good trainer, I think the first point has to be my own experiences as a trainee. And I trained for nearly 14 years from primary qualification before I became a consultant surgeon. Trained across three continents, worked about 22, 23 different jobs in three continents, and worked with more than 35 bosses, various descriptions in terms of uh, senior registrars, senior consultants, professors, whoever. And they were a combination of people. There were different types of people, You'll remember the good and good, bad and the ugly, the famous movie, and this is exactly what trainers that I came across were. Some of them were brilliant, but they, some of them had great surgical skills, some of them had great training techniques, personalities where some were kind and generous, and others were bullies, cruel, whatever. They were all there. But I learned something from each of them, how to do something well. But equally importantly, I think, from some people, how not to do things, or how to do things badly. And that's as valuable a lesson for a trainee to bear in mind. Now, what's happening in terms of evolution in education over the last, so especially over the last two, three decades now? There is, these are the points that I'm just going to touch upon during the course of this talk. And I'm mindful of the fact that we're already behind schedule, but I'll try and skip through some of these things as much as possible. But there's been a lot of changes in the trends of the technology in terms of adult self-learning, no apprenticeship as used to be in the old days, that was a standard part of, especially skills training. Uh, and of course, we're all familiar with all the digital learning tools which have become standard these days. And we also have to cope with the changes in the attitudes that our trainees have compared to ourselves when we were trainees. Many of us, when we were, we still remember. I, I, I didn't, the concept of work-life balance didn't exist when I was a medical student or a trainee. Work was life, and vice versa. Your predominant driving force was how much more you could learn. And that's what you were, that was the yardstick by which you were measured. You weren't measured about, you know, if you could play good football and be a reasonable surgeon. That was a side, side show. But these things have changed. Attitudes from our trainees. And the one thing that I want to emphasize again is trainees now come with the, with the presumption that they have a right to be trained. In my day, as I'm sure it was in many of your days, it was a privilege that you afforded your time and your skills to train me. Thank you very much. That was the attitude. Now it's my right. Teach me how to do this, because I am your trainee, I am your student. So these are things that we have to cope with. 
if you're going to continue to, uh, to stay and become a good trainer. This is just all of you are senior people in the audience. There's nothing new in this slide. It's just what exactly are we as a trainer? We've got to accept the fact that we have we come that the job comes with responsibilities. In, incredible level of responsibility in the fact that we have to support and more talent, talent. We have to be aware of the limitations of the training. Some need more encouragement. Some need to be held back. Some need to be um, um, you know, um, carrot approach, some need the stick approach. All of these things we have to be mindful of and deliver it, uh, deliver it well. But regardless of all of that, it's a great privilege, in my opinion, a great man to be a trainer. So, from a training point of view, any training session, and I'm going to keep this as generic as possible, given the audience here is not um, uh, not polar to surgeons, but these are all simple, simple rules which most of us, there's nothing new about this. Set clear goals, make sure you take the role seriously, approach and have a structure to whatever you're doing, and modular training is very, very useful. And I'll touch on those two in a, in a bit more detail in a few slides. So, changing tech, what exactly does this mean? You know, in the days when I, used, I learned the dominant source of information was textbooks and listening to lectures and taking notes in lectures and the hard copy paper version. All of that has gradually changed to the point where textbooks have almost become just things that you find in libraries. People don't read textbooks anymore. The things available, instant gratification on your phone or your laptop or whatever. And we as trainers need to start to be, and need to be aware of these changes and accommodate ourselves and our techniques accordingly. Otherwise, you can't be a good trainer. So, the progression from paper based learning resources, as you say here, both from patients' point of view and from healthcare professionals' point of view. Patients standard way of communicating with patients, giving information to patients, was to give them a leaflet when they left your clinic saying, I've told you about diverticular disease, here's a leaflet, here's a leaflet about what you should expect to do, go home and read it. Much of it got thrown away, much of, them, much of it was understandable for patients because of limitations in terms of how well they understood things. And similarly from healthcare professionals, we used to have this two-dimensional classroom-based or technology uh, or um, technology restricted stuff. So how did we cope with it in my department, in my um, in my um, uh, in my own area of uh, expertise? I was very fortunate to get an opportunity to work with this company over the last 20, 20 years now. Um, they are specialists in medical media, and they create. Sorry. And they create um, incredible, they support us in creating incredible medical media material. So, um, the first thing that we did back in 2009, more than maybe 14, 13, 14 years ago, was to come up with DVDs for patient information to support patients. And this was our first patient information DVD to explain to patients about the whole diagnostic pathway and what to expect in the journey through their diagnosis of cancer. Followed it up with an enhanced recovery after surgery DVD. So all of these are DVDs that we gave to patients. And in the context of training, it was also the DVD that um, became very popular for a long time in terms of how to do the stepwise approach to laparoscopic colorectal resections. Again, as a DVD format. All of these, most of these have won various recognitions at various um, national, international, you know, um, awards and fora, and I've been very privileged with that. But the problem is, with DVDs, you have a limitation. You have to physically give it to somebody. Either in a conference like this, you can hand out DVDs. In fact, I remember when I came to uh, Erebil and um, ran some workshops and, um, uh, and the courses and stuff there, in my suitcase, I brought about I don't know, 200 DVDs uh, for the stepwise approach. Was that 2014, uh, Dr. Aziz? 
2015. 2015, yeah. So we had the, um, we literally carried those DVDs with us uh, and handed it off. So that was a limitation. You could send it off by post, you could send it off by uh, courier delivery or whatever, but it had to be physically trans uh, transported. And of course, keeping a DVD up to date is impossible. Because if you want to change one bit, you've got to burn the whole thing again. So if you want to change uh, barium enemas got replaced by CT colonography, you can't just delete barium enema and replace it with CT colon. Besides, even if I did that for the DVDs that I've got in my office, how do I collect it in the DVD that you have collected from me last year? So it doesn't get updated. So lots of technical headaches. So we came up with the option, my team, the, my team and the Digimet lot I was working with, we said, that's it, apps are the way of the future, 2014, we said, the hell with all of this, we'll go into apps. We created apps for all our uh, educational products, incredible downloads around the world, and we said, great, we have cracked it. We had it. Because all it took was for some bigwig in Apple to change the iOS platform, and all our apps stopped working. So we were completely at the mercy of Apple. And the same would apply, if, so we said we can't carry on with this uh, system because we were doing all of this completely free. In other words, there was no download cost, there was nothing at the end user. The DVDs were free, the apps were free, everything was being uh, provided at no, no cost to the end user. So we couldn't afford to keep updating things uh, and create parallel ones for the Android platforms and so on. So, we said we have to come with a final, more, more relevant um, solution. And one of the things that we came up with was the, the streaming website that I'll talk to you about in a second. <coughs> but in the context of improving healthcare, one of the things that I have become very conscious about is we talk about improving training by training doctors to be better cardiologists or better radiologists or better surgeons or whatever. And we talk about a lot about medical school training or specialist training in terms of... But that in itself isn't going to make a great deal of improvement on its own because we also need to have educated, motivated, committed patients. Ultimately, a patient who does not know what to expect isn't going to be as cooperative or as um, as as, um, as as likely to recover from the process of whatever treatment you're giving them. And of course, we want to get to the right at the beginning of the journey of the whole patient, uh, of the whole healthcare problem, which is a healthy member of the public who needs to be aware of screening programs to be able to participate in it at the right time so that he or she can become a patient at an early stage. We have to make sure that the primary care contact point that the patient accesses has to be aware of what symptoms to be considered red flagged and passed on. And then comes the whole thing about training the secondary care um, in terms of the specialist services. So that's the whole integrated education concept. And that is why it, I think it is incredibly important in terms of improving the whole um, the patient journey. And if you, without this, I found that continuity of care and high quality of care is almost impossible. We're not, we're not able to get the patient as informed as possible. Obviously, that will depend, vary from people to people. Some patients have a better understanding of what you're trying to tell them. Some less so, but regardless of that. So our solution to address this problem of um, how to get this message across was our this website that we launched about four years ago, or well, just over four years ago now. Um, it's www.colorateleducation.com, easy to remember. Please feel free to access it. And here is a short video which talks about that resource.
for various grades of professionals. This is a truly integrated educational website providing a huge wealth of information designed to support patients and their carers through every aspect of the diagnosis and management of colorectal cancer, as well as many other conditions. There are also dozens of hours worth of experience shared by genuine patients who have had to go through this treatment journey themselves. On the professional section, we have paid a great deal of attention to recording live operation for various conditions, including systematic training tools and specific management protocols. The training is not just aimed at surgeons, but also at junior doctors of all disciplines as well as non-medical healthcare professionals, such as general ward nurses and specific staff like colorectal and stoma nurses. In addition, the website is also a platform through which we deliver a range of educational programs, webinars, courses, predominantly through the digital route, although we also use it for sharing information from our live courses as well, which we'll be restarting now that the pandemic situation is a bit under control. I was very lucky. A belly ache one Friday morning resulted in a tumor operation in Los Angeles. And the center of excellence people with me was just 20 minutes away, so my guardian angel was working well that weekend. The supporting website of course, is split as it is in two ways. One is for clinicians in terms of training and guidance. The other is for patients in terms of reassurance and information. And that website can go worldwide as a marker for an example of tremendous service and innovation. Out of the valleys of Wales, out of Wales itself, it can travel worldwide so that others, like myself, can benefit from that. When I was diagnosed, I saw a professor and he asked me to have a look at the website. I had a look and uh, it was really helpful for me. There was people there who had been through the operation that I was about to go through and uh, they were discussing uh, their stomas and the problems they had. And, I was prepared uh, for what happened. This video allows an insight into the acceptance and management of the patient's stomas and how they go back to living an independent life. It answered every possible scenario to do with bowel cancer and bowel related problems. It was all actual staff, nursing staff, medical staff, doctors, consultants, many of whom that I had met, I was able to um, review all the information in my own home when I wanted to. I was able to go back to it for reassurance, um, for procedure information. I find the website is a great learning and, uh, and training tool actually for all the uh, surgeons interested in colorectal surgery. Uh, it was a great support to me through my training um, and then it's, it's nice to have this tool just at the uh, reach of your fingertips so whenever you have operation planned or you have something done you just go straight to the website, review the steps, just look at what you need to do tomorrow, just look at the right way, what's the appropriate steps for your operation, so it was a great tool. The stepwise approach videos have given me the confidence to go into theatre and replicate those skills that I've learned. This is the standard set up for a, a left side of the section and starting from the top end of the patient, next step is to try and identify the left ureter. I find it a lot easier to use the left ureter fossa. As a trainee I use the website for, for training purposes to look at the anatomy and just to to, to explain to patients for consenting reasons, and now that I've moved on to a consultant role, I've been telling all trainees I've come across, be it in, in Swansea or in Newcastle, where I've recently been, which is what an excellent training resource it is. When I became a consultant, still I find it a great tool. Uh, I still, every now and then, I log into it, uh, looking even in the patient section, patient experience, know exactly what your patients are looking for for their care. Uh, know exactly what your patients are expecting from you, know what their needs. The website was comprehensive, very reassuring, and gave me a positive attitude towards the forthcoming surgery. For me, of course, when you've got something wrong with you, you look for reassurance, you look for information, don't you really? You look for support. 
from that website. I should be good. I hope you have enjoyed this little tour around the website and the experience of some of the people who have used it. Please do pay us a visit at www.colorateleducation.com. Leave us your feedback. It would be very much appreciated because that's how this website is. So the, please feel free to adapt. There is no, um, because it's a free website and the resources, and the resources are, um, sorry, this, um, yeah, and, the, and if you do have any suggestions, uh, then we can add things to it, and we're constantly upgrading, modifying, and changing it as we go along. And this is just from Google Analytics in terms of um, how regularly it gets hit with more than 2,000 hits, um, and um, more than 20, more than 25 percent of people coming back for e-visits, sex distribution, and on the patients, this patient section as well as the um, split between the professional and patient sections access is approximately 50-50, 48-52. Um, the bounce rate, to those of you who are not familiar with running websites, the bounce rate is when somebody bounces out of the website without going beyond the first page. In other words, you hit the website and say, I'm not interested, go away. And any a bounce rate of less than 40%, I'm told, is good. We have been averaging around 10-11% for the last, um, uh, last couple of years, which is very satisfying. And all of this, we have no money for search engine optimization, any of those fancy things. You type in the word colorectal education into Google search and uh, we are first on the first page, which is generic uh, development, organic development, not because of um, uh, any, any investment in search engine optimization. This is some more some analytics. So the history from uh, my own experience has been to progress from the paper-based resources gradually through the DVDs, apps, and now the online streaming, as I have just shared with you. And all of these, are the tools that I was talking about as trainers having to cope with changing uh, ch changes in technology. So here are some tools. What, what have I learned from being a trainer for the last nearly 30 years? Um, I think it's very useful to set clear objectives at the beginning of the session, just as we do with a lecture, just as we do with a class movement, uh, with a, with a, with a um, uh, workshop or whatever. But do that for, it's easy to do it for almost any environment, even though this is predominantly in the context of an operation theater session, um, a session. However, this is completely applicable even for ward rounds, even for, even for clinics, whatever you're doing. You get a training, say to the trainee, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? You're going to be for the next four hours. I, depending on the level of the training, I could say to the trainee, I want you to take the history and then call me and present the case to me, and that is what you're going to do. Or a more senior trainee could be a question of, let's not waste time doing all of that. Bring to me two cases of your choice that you want to discuss in detail, and we can have a case basis. But we can, the trainee shouldn't go away from that session thinking he was expecting to discuss every case, because that's what we agreed in the beginning, that we would discuss two cases. Or equally, the trainee shouldn't expect that he's not going to have any discussions at all and you start calling him saying, why aren't you discussing the cases? So I think it makes a huge difference to both the trainee's expectations and how the trainer can cope with that. And in terms of when we have, as most of us have, multiple trainees in the room at any given time, operation theater, clinic, ward rounds, whatever, we'll have sometimes junior doctors, sometimes medical students, sometimes assistant consultant surgeons or senior, um, senior registrars. And I think it's very important to be able to designate clear roles saying, I'm going to train you for this, but you are going to train him for that because he is junior to you and you're already competent in that. And she is going to be an observer, but at this stage, she's actually an expert. She can become the trainer to train you. And that way, we're all very clear about which bits of the operation, who's going to do, again, I say operation, but completely transferable skills. <coughs> So it breaks that down to having modular approach, the stepwise approach. And this is something which we have built up over the years in my department. And I have found that it's incredibly useful. And I'll just talk to you briefly about this. Because I thought it was common sense, but it's not commonly practiced. And for example, here are the steps of, I mean, I won't bore you with this because not many of you are colorectal surgeons. But Laparoscopic resection of rectum, 
you must do step one before you go to step two. You must do step two before you go to step three. You must do step four before you go to step five, etc., etc., etc. Similarly for item collectively. You must do step one before you go to step two. To put it in simple terms, I think about it as when I got dressed to come and stand here, I did not put on my tie first and then decide what shirt to put on. It is a stepwise approach. You put the shirt on and then you put the tie on. And then you put the jacket on. If you try to do it the reverse way, I don't put the clothes on and then decide, oh, I must go and have a shower now. So there is this, we use all these techniques routinely in our life. But in the same principle is transferable in the context of clinical skills. And I know from my own experience with uh, Moya Disease, who is the anesthetist who works closely with me, he has been using these techniques uh, in some of the training he does for his anesthetic um, trainees. It's completely transferable. It just literally sits down, break it down into how, what exactly are you going to do. You hold this in your right hand, and then you pick this up with your left hand, and you do this, and you do this, and you break it down into modular steps. Works. The other thing that we've also found very useful is having a structured progression. So the trainee has something measurable to aim at. In other words, I need to know at what level I am, and I need to have something to aspire to. Okay? And this is what we've developed and published. In fact, uh, Mr. Kumar, who's one of our speakers here, um, published this as a, a paper from my department um, last, last year. But we've been working on this for the last 12 years. And I won't, I was going to run a video on that, but because of the time constraints, I won't bother with that now. I'll just go on to the, uh, but any of the surgeons, anybody who's interested in um, having a look at that, first of all, it's available on the website anyway, the colorvicleducation.com website. But if any of you are interested, please send me an email and I'll send you the link uh, for that particular training video, which again, is transferable, even though it's done in the context of Laparoscopic colorectal surgery is completely transferable to uh, to a cardiology clinic. Forget about surgery. And changing dynamic roles in theatres is very useful, as as I, as I previously mentioned. A trainee can become the trainer when you've got a more junior trainee. And I myself, I'm a trainee. When I attend a conference like this, when I sit down and listen to the next speaker, I am here. My my role changes from being the speaker to a member of the audience. And we do this routinely, so we just have to make it structured. We also have a preceptorship program for established surgeons. We've been doing that for since 2004 for um, consultants and laparoscopic consultant colorectal surgeons, particularly with laparoscopic surgery, where they come to my department, watch, observe, and then I go and stand with them in their operation theaters to assist them for one, two, three, four, five, six cases as required till they feel competent, until they achieve a level of competence. These are established surgeons and um, The last thing on these useful tools I wanted to add is about having a debrief session. We do this very often. We do this sometimes very badly. Okay? And the one thing that we all are familiar with in terms of a debrief is we ask the trainee, what do you think, how do you think? That, that session went, did you find that useful, How do you, what do you think you learned out of it, what did you do well, and what do you think you could have done better? These are questions that we all get to ask, which most trainers will do that as a part of seeking feedback from that session. However, not many people do this bit. Not many people tell the trainee, that's all good, you have shared your experiences. Tell me how I did. What could I have done better? Did I do well? Was I patient enough? Was I pushy too much? Did I, did I challenge you enough? I need to know because that's the only way I'm going to improve. And there is no shame in asking for that. There is no point in the trainee just saying, yes, 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 it was a wonderful session, and then going away thinking, what a waste of time. I would rather know it was a waste of time, but at least next time, I'll do better if I want to improve. So please, again, a small thing, but a huge thing. Apart from that, it also makes the trainee feel valued. It makes them think that they are, their opinion matters. 
I actually care. I'm confident enough to ask him or her to tell me what I could have done better. Uh, we've been, as, I've, um, as, as the chairman mentioned earlier, we've run loads of courses, and we've been running these courses for many years, workshops, live courses in my department and in the operational theatres, etc. But of course, with the pandemic, it forced us to think options are don't do any more courses, forget about it, sit at home, watch TV, or do something different. And that's when I discovered the whole world of Zoom and Teams and stuff like that. And we've been running virtual courses right almost from the beginning of the pandemic, from June, July uh, 2020. And this is just slides to show the different courses and how they are picked up internationally with a great deal of, uh, for example, we just ran the Enhanced Recovery course just a few weeks ago. And there were more than 320 people registered. And one or two colleagues from this room have told me that they enjoyed it, they, att they attended it. Because there was no targeted audience, it was just um, picked up through the website. And we've, we've got a, a laparoscopic colorectal masterclass coming up in the next, um, uh, about, in about three weeks' time. And we've got nearly 200 registered already on it. Now, as you can see, the global reach, the advantage, of course, in the days when I was running courses like this, in a classroom like this, I was limited by how many people could fit in the classroom, how many people can come into my operation theatre, how many people can come into the lecture theatre. Those limitations are needed, can reach all over the world. And again, this is part of the technology that we, my team and I, have embraced. And in this world, this is the only way to be able to deliver education, because unfortunately or fortunately, the old ways are um, have changed, things have evolved. So, we've talked about the trends and techniques, uh, technology changes over the whole evolution in education. I've shared with you some of these things, and I'm trying to rush through these as much as possible. Just a few more slides. In terms of attitudes, the work-life balance issue I've already mentioned. The whole attitude is changing. I'm not saying any of these, please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that work-life balance is a bad thing. I'm not saying that work, 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 which is the culture a few, a few decades ago was the right thing. I'm just saying that things are changing. And if things are changing for the trainee, and I want to be a good trainer, I have to recognize it, I have to adapt to it, or I don't have to continue training. I can turn around and say, the way I like to train was that way, I can't do it like this, I don't enjoy it, give it up. Trainees these days are common. They think in terms of employment rather than a vocation. Professional pride is not the same as it was. People are, it would be unthinkable in my day as a surgical trainee for me to leave an operation and say, my relief is here now, I finish at 8 o'clock, my shift is finished. Uh, good night, professor. My relief is here and stop out of the operation and tell me night day to take over. It would have been absolutely unthinkable. The only thing that only time that would have happened would have been if there was some serious issue, either with my own personal health, I was going to faint or whatever, or with some serious personal matter that I had to leave to attend. Today it's not unusual. I'm here for a job, I'm finishing my shift. I'll, I'll literally pass the baton on, hand over and go home. So these are things changing. So don't be offended. I was offended. The first time I saw that happen in the operation theatre on my ward rooms ten years ago, I said, Gee, what happened here? But that's a fact. And I can't cry about it. Um, and there's also a challenging complaining culture. I mean, people like to um, people like to moan about things because they want it their way. It's, 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 it's the world. Everybody expects it. So, we need to all we need to stay up to speed with them. So, reflections then. Okay, what have I learned in all these years being a trainer? So, about surgery in general, about decision making, about specific skills, and about myself. So, but procedures in general, I told you about the modular, uh, modular nature of surgical procedures, how to master a set of skills, how to be able to predict and predict easy or difficult steps to 
uh, and when and how to get the hell out of there or stop the training session and take over and do the job without necessarily uh, leaving us until it becomes too late. So those are things I've learned about surgery in general. About decision making, breaking down the decision making process, just as I said about breaking down the process of an operation and the steps, the decision making process about patient is presented with this, how do you reach the diagnostic or the uh, uh, next step in management through a systematic algorithmic way of reaching it. So understand the decision making process, how to recognize and predict good and bad decisions and how to translate all this in terms of passing call on to trainees. Specific skills, understand that there's more than my way of doing things. And about myself, how to be patient, how to control my frustration. I was ashamed last week, I think Dr. Aziz was in theater with me, I actually lost my temper. After a very long time, I lost my temper with a student, with a medical student. And I was genuinely ashamed for the last three or four days, I've been feeling miserable. But it is difficult to control your frustrations and to hide your own levels of expectations. And if you expect somebody to be able to say something that is obvious to you and they don't get it, then you feel really, really ready to shout. But that's the kind of stuff that you need to try to master. So I mentioned about these points in terms of what I've learned about surgery, decision making, about specific surgical skills or about myself. And guess who I learned it all from? The vast majority of it, I have learned them from trainees. It's my trainees who have made me a better trainer. Not my professors, not my trainers. My trainees have taught me how to be a better trainer. I've learned all of those things through trainees over the last generations of trainees. So where next? How can I get better is always a challenge as long as you, as long as you want to continue to train, teach, and whenever you get an opportunity, I'll, I'll observe other people being trained. And very often I'll observe a senior trainee tra training a junior trainee and learn something and listen to the feedback. So in summary, stressful, exhausting, frustrating, exasperating, whatever adjectives you want to use, intensely satisfying and fulfilling and never boring. So, in reflections, as a trainer, we have a great honor and a privilege to have been able to provide a high quality of service. I'm very humbled, I'm very proud, but very humbled to have been blessed with the ability to teach. My mother was a teacher. She was professor of English in Bombay uh, when I was growing up. She died when I was uh, 19. Um, but I'm so blessed to have been uh, the ability to teach. And I'd love the opportunity to do that for a bit longer. And in case any of you are wondering which one is the real image and which one is the, uh, which one is the image and which one is the um, mirror image, please don't be surprised. <coughs> so, one last pitch for the colorfuleducation.com website. Please, uh, please access it. It's got loads and loads of information. And I can't leave a talk without a color video. A color video. Uh, Thank you. Thanks very much. And as far as